we really have a warped sense of 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 um, return on investment and risk. We're constantly investing in things that ultimately, um, and this was exposed by the pandemic, that ultimately leads to 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 worse death rates, worse e economic outcomes, um, worse housing co outcomes for people of color, and as demographic shift um, where we're, be we're becoming a, um, a minority white country, you know, we that calculus is just not going to hold up. I mean, it, it, it's, it's putting all of us in peril. And, and, and I say this all the time, if, there, if we learned anything from this pandemic is that when our neighbors are sick, we are then vulnerable. This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend Andre Perry. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and the author of a book that came out, uh, I think, quite ahead of the curve in May of 2020 called Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. It just seems like now everybody's immersed in what Andre was illuminating a little over a year ago. And obviously that book came out, so you were thinking about it well before that time. You know, and a lot of people think about problems, but you seem to have a vision of what was causing these problems that yeah. now other people are locking on to. So let, let's start with what inspired you to write the book? What, what did you see on the horizon? And, and tell us a little bit about what, developed, what you developed in, in, over the course of writing the book. Well, there's, there's two major reasons why I, I wrote the book. One is I, I would go back home um, to my hometown of Wilkinburg, Pennsylvania, and I would visit the, the home where I grew up. And as the story was told to me uh, as a child growing up, uh, um, that my mother at the time of my birth, she was poor. She already had a, a um, child when she was 15 and me when she was 17. And the, and the story is told that there was a deal made between my maternal grandmother and the woman I call mom. Her name is Elsie Boyd. Um, and Elsie Boyd was an older matriarch in the neighborhood that took in kids. And a deal was made that she would take me in to this home, 1320 Hill Avenue, Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. And, um, and my brother came and then... As I was grow growing up, she reared or informally adopted a lot of, of children in the hood. She took in between 12 to 15 kids at various, various stages. Some would stay a few weeks. Some would stay a few months. I would stay until I graduated from high school. And, and, and that, so that home that we grew up in is worth so much to me personally. But when you look at the list price of that home, uh, it's really, uh, you could pick it up for, by agreeing to pay taxes on it. Um, and compare, comparably, homes across uh, a nearby neighborhood are worth thousands of dollars more. So I, I wanted just to see the overall conditions um, that led to me growing up in that home and, and its impact today. And when I started doing that, I found that um, my mom lived in areas uh, that were redlined. She lived in areas um, where there was urban renewal, where highway construction, or uh, um, in the case of my mom, it was actually the building of the Civic Arena um, that forced her to move to Wilkinsburg. Um, and there were a lot of things that happened in the past. And, um, and I forgot to mention one other thing, that my father, who was born in Detroit, um, um, eventually uh, became a heroin addict. Um, he was probably abusive. And um, he died in a prison right outside of Detroit, Jackson State Penitentiary, now known as the you know, Michigan State Penitentiary. And so also, when I looked at where he lived, he, he lived in areas that were red line, where highway construction forced them to move. They, they both, my mom and my father, were surrounded in, um, by racial housing covenant, so they couldn't le le leave. And so I just started studying the conditions. And, and what I found after um, 
comparing home prices in black majority neighborhoods to those in white areas. And, and what I did, what my team of, of Jonathan Rothwell and David Harshbarger, we controlled for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics, because we wanted to get an apples to apples comparison between homes. And what we found pretty much astounds that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. Cumulatively, um, there's a loss of about 156 billion in lost equity. And, and, and you know, Rob, that's, I mean, to put that in perspective, how big a number that is, 156 billion would have financed more than 8 million four-year degrees um, based upon the average cost of a four-year public education. It would, have fin it would have paid for or financed more than 4 million black-owned businesses based upon the average amount black people use to start up their firms. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over, covered all of Hurricane Katrina damage, and it's doubled the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. So um, my father, who was a heroin addict, if he lived in areas that the housing were with market rate or the white rate, he would have had better infrastructure, better schooling, greater opportunity to go to college or start a business. You know, um, and mm -hmm. I say all the time that, that there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. When things go wrong in black communities, we blame the people and we don't look at the policies that extract wealth on the daily. So for me, what you know, I'm, I'm working on um, and my, the meat of my project is to remove the drags of racism that throttle the growth in black communities. And that should happen, um, that, that if you remove these drags, you'll see people get greater equity, um, have a greater chance to go to um, college, a greater chance of starting a business. And so that's the, the meat of the enterprise. And, then, and there's one thing, and I'll just go this, through this briefly. When I was in education, I did a lot of work in education in New Orleans post-Katrina. And I would hear this same refrain over and over again. They would say, uh, if we could only fix the schools, everything would be all right. Not seeing that school, schools are connected to, to housing segregation and, and the way that finance leads to schools with predominantly black people in it getting $23 billion less than their white counterparts. And so when people say, if we can fix the schools and ignore how schools are financed, then they're just burying their head in the sand to the structural inequality that is really the problem. And so for me, you know, it's an exploration of my hometown, how I grew up, my upbringing, but um, it's also just for, uh, my effort to remove these drags of racism in, in markets, not just housing, but um, markets that affect the, the quality of life of black people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fascinating to me because you're talking about essentially people acting as though these indicators are some kind of scientific objectiveness. And what value is, is subjective and psychological and based on which you might call it many unconscious traditions and fears, as well as the number of acres or the number of stories or the number of bedrooms. And, and that interaction between the value of the house, on the one hand, its ability to create what I'll call collateral, to foster all kinds of things that improve the quality of life, and which might call the feedback that when those things aren't there, it depresses the, uh, the way in which the house is assessed for that which is around it. Well, when you see the spiral, the only way you can, it seems to me, just listening to you, that you can break out of it is to get in to yeah. that subject's subjective psychology and fear. Now, I remember when you and I have talked in the past, uh, on, not online, but, but we just in conversation, uh, you've mentioned to me that there have been some examples where white people are essentially put in the living room to sell the house yeah. or have the house assessed and just changing the artwork and the books on the shelf changes yeah. how people perceive the house. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, um, um, if folks been reading the New York Times or, um, I mean, many newspapers all across the country, there's been a recurring story in different locations of people who essentially are either trying to refinance a home, sell a home, and they get an appraiser. And whether they're in a black neighborhood or a white neighborhood, um, the original appraiser comes in very low. And they, they suspect something's wrong because they can look at how homes are valued right across the street and go, that doesn't line up with what just happened right down the street. And so many um, black homeowners have done their own sort of uh, test case or, or social experiment. Mm -hmm. They removed the books, the artwork, the and and actually got white stand-ins. Um, in one case, the the white stand-in was a husband, so you had an interracial couple. Um, in the first case, the 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 black wife uh, was there, was present when the appraiser came. And the second time around, um, it the the white husband stayed, and this is after removing all the artwork and books. And um, eventually the, uh, the, the second appraiser came in um, $140,000 higher uh, or, or something around that. In, in the case in San Francisco, it came in $400,000 higher. In, a, in another case wow. in um, Indianapolis, $120,000 higher. And so, you know, it, it, it is really the, the the very idea of a white savior um, that is taking place, and 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 when folks come, when you see a white person, it's um, and you get a higher value evaluation, you're really seeing the intrinsic value of whiteness um, take hold. That mm -hmm. um, they 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 see whiteness, and somehow the property is miraculously hundreds of thousands of dollars more now. The, the, it's clear that, in my mind, this is almost theft, because when you're talking about losing $140,000, you're really talking about uh, uh, throttling a person's ability to to start a business, to get another home, to, to pass on generational wealth. I mean, it is a, I mean, it's theft. And, but, and it, but the one thing I don't like about the reporting on this is that it's almost focused on individual appraisers and, and it and it says hey this is the problem of individual appraisers no this is also a function of structural racism you know my research looks at the impact of of, of black the black concentration in a neighborhood and how that leads to um wealth extraction um in a systemic way and so um, and as you put it, that these there's these cultural subjective practices um, that are really inhibiting uh, wealth development. And I'll just be very clear about this: the price comparison model that appraisers use when they compare a home um, the, um, within a neighborhood that's been discriminated against over time. You essentially just recycle the discrimination over and over again. Yeah. And and let's also be clear that that eighty five percent of appraisers are white, um seventy five percent are male. And we know that there is a, a connection between representation and outcome and all subjective types of uh, exercises. And so um and, and one more thing, and let's not forget the history. That appraiser, uh, the, the, the price comparison model was also a tool to keep black people out of neighborhoods. And, and so we clearly need new practices that are devoid of this, this tradition um, because it's really this limiting um, wealth development um, and um, sometimes encouraging theft, in my opinion, um, when it comes to the valuing of homes. Mm -hmm. when, uh, let me ask, uh, I'm thinking of what I might call comparative geography. Are there places where this phenomena is extreme and other places where it's quite diminished, where, where essentially it's yeah. not profound? Uh, oh, yeah. Can, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I'd be know, interested where 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 we should where we should live if we want to overcome ooh. racism. Where if we're a black person, what what's a place where you're going to get a fair shake? Lynchburg, Virginia. Let me tell you, there's an 85 percent difference between equivalent homes in black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. Meaning, if you helicoptered a home from a black neighborhood and put it in a a white one with similar social circumstances, again, similar mm -hmm. educational levels, um, crime levels, it would increase in value by 86%, 85%. Wow. I mean, it's insane. And, and, and then on the flip side, you have places like Nashville, believe it or not, where it's a plus 10% value in black neighborhoods. Now, mm -hmm. um, that is fraught because... Um, when we looked at the um, home ownership rates and, 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 and other factors, um, it's a very older homeowner in those neighborhoods. So it, clearly those places are vulnerable to gentrification. Um, um, and, but that's what, what's happening in most cases where you see um, prices, uh, prices of home, list prices of home so low that eventually – only people with cash can buy them. I, I mean, your hometown of Detroit, for instance, um, there are thousands of properties priced below a point that a, ba a ba bank won't back with a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so the only way you can acquire a home is through a contract. And there's no regulation between those kind of contracts um, between a buyer and seller. So there's a lot of just... Um, uh, unsavory practices going in yeah. in, in, in those things. So, um, but on the uh, but again, th there are some places where home values are higher in black communities, and it, it tends to be in areas where there's higher black home ownership, um, a black insti or, or anchor institutions like HBCUs, uh, black-owned banks, or or also mm -hmm. government um, entities where there's a lot of uh, we're higher rates of employment because we know a black people have a, a better uh, a better chance of being employed where there's lots of public sector jobs. And so there are some factors that are, are tend to sort of uh, increase value, but overall it's much more um, devaluation, as I said. And, and I use the word devaluation to put action on, so to say that, Hey, there's a, a purposeful or uh, disparate impact on the assets in black neighborhoods. They're, they're being devalued. Um, and, 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 and part of my mission is to calculate that black tax, if you will, so that we can restore the value uh, that's been extracted by racism. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, how do I say, I think a, tr a tremendously important context that you're exploring. Are there international comparisons? And we know that the, what might call original sin of America, that racism was very profound. Do you see similar kinds of um, influence in marketplaces outside the United States? Well, you know, I, I'll put it this way, because it, clearly in many different um, contexts, in at least in the industrialized world, that you see a lack of investment in black neighborhoods, in immigrant mm -hmm. neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And and there's so many um, sort of these boards that are created to es essentially determine value. Um, and, and, and those boards or these um, organizations that set the value of various things from homes to um, bond ratings to a number of issues, um, are, are steeped in racism. I mean, and, and so when I look at um, homes and, and, and communities that are per persistently undervalued and divest or were not invested in, um, you can also find similar bodies that have essentially deemed these neighborhoods unworthy of investment until, until white people move in. And then miraculously, uh, there's a heightened value. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's insane.
Um, I, I encourage people to go to the my, uh, the Brookings website, the Devaluation of Assets in Black um, Neighborhoods. It's a it's a report that um, anchors my my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in American Black Cities. Um, but the report can be found on the Brookings website. But you see, as the concentration of blackness increases, the price decrease, and it's very linear. And in the, the but the reverse is true. As the as the population of white uh, people increase or um, increase in a neighborhood, so does the value. And and you know it goes without saying. You're really seeing that intrinsic value of whiteness really appear or come out of the wash in the value of home. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, last question on this kind of comparative theme. Uh, what happens to Latin communities relative to white communities, and again, relative to the black community? Yeah, we, we're actually uh, starting that research now. Um, I will say this, I, I suspect a similar phenomenon, but not the exact same thing, because remember, it was anti-black policy that really um, shifted um, these systems in housing, um, employment discrimination, and in other areas. It was really anti-black policy, and certainly other people were caught up in that. We still see, for instance, um, home values in formerly redlined areas um, generally lower than others in spite of the population in it. So, um, so that impact of redlining still has a drag on um, the communities, regardless of people who are in it. And, and this is something that we also found, you know, black people are no longer the predominant group in formerly redlined areas. It's Hispanics, then whites, then blacks. Um, who live in um, those areas, and you see um, um, sort of worse outcomes in those areas regardless. So I, I would venture to say that as brown people move into black neighborhoods, and you're seeing this all over the country, um, their, their wealth is being robbed by those same anti-black policies overall. So I, 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 I think you, you'll see a similar... Um, um, sort of devaluation, but um, I think that you'll see it more pronounced in black neighborhoods because it was anti-black policy that led to um, many of these practices that extracted wealth. Hmm. So in this, what I'll call spiral or, or interactive amplifying loop, we see that the, the lower valuations diminish what you might call the wealth power collateral yep. upon which a more vigorous system can be built, educational institutions, small businesses, probably things like uh, transportation opportunities for people who could reach out a little further, where the, to explore jobs that are more vibrant if getting yeah. from here to there was easy to do. There are all kinds of you know, what's the quality of healthcare clinics? All of these things which you've shared with me are, how do I say, intertwined with yes. these valuations. I'm a doctor's son. I think the diagnosis that you have, you know, what you might call excavated from your childhood and made systematic, it sings to me about the stuff I observed in around Detroit, in suburban Detroit on the Lower East Side. And, but, I, but I'm a doctor's son, so I, the diagnosis is brilliant. But doctor, what's the remedy? How are we gonna get out of this spiral? Where's, where's, yeah. the, where's the leverage point? You know, I, and I, I say uh, broadly, nothing grows without investment. I, I'm, what the Vietnamese philosopher, um, and excuse me for mispronouncing the name, Tic Tac Han. Yeah, Tic um, Tac Han, yeah. 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 And, uh, one of my favorite quotes was, if you see a head of lettuce and it's not growing, and I'm paraphrasing, um, you don't blame the lettuce. You look to see if it's getting enough water, if it's yeah, getting yeah. enough sunlight, if the soil's rich. You never blame the lettuce. But when it comes to 
um, black communities and development, we're constantly blaming the lettuce. And so we need to make sure the soil is rich, it's getting water. In other words, we, we need to invest in the infrastructure and the other surrounding things that will lead to growth. And so the remedy is around investment. We're not going to, you know, like, what, you know, the, the ultimate bad play on this is um, let's um, arrest people. Um, let's make the community safer by arresting people, and you're literally extracting people from the neighborhood, which makes matters worse. Mm -hmm. And so the ultimate, I mean, broadly speaking, is to invest in communities, to remove these sort of uh, heirlooms of segregation, these, the, the, you know, the, these uh, appraisal practices and other real estate practices that were uh, prevalent um, during a time of of, of segregation, we got to remove these things and replace them with ones that are anti-racist, that encourage inclusion. And you know, Rob, this is something that um, we've talked about in private. We really have a warped sense of of, of um, return on investment and risk. You know what what, what we what the hor a horrible practice or tradition developed from redlining is that the, the homeowner, the federally backed homeowners loan corporation deemed black neighborhoods too risky for investment. When in fact, it was the segregated communities that imperiled black people um, long term. But when you look at interest rates, when you look at investment, it's, we're almost rewarding what's actually causing harm. Um, and also, we got to rethink what the return on those investments are. We're constantly investing in things that ultimately, um, and this was exposed by the pandemic, that ultimately leads to, to, to worse death rates, worse e economic outcomes, um, worse housing co outcomes for people of color. And as demographic shift, um, where we're, be we're becoming a... Um, a minority white um, um, country, you know, we that that calculus is just not going to hold up. I mean, it, it, it's it's putting all of us in peril. And 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 I say this all the time: if they, if we learned anything from this pandemic, is that when our neighbors are sick, we are then vulnerable. And that's true economically as well. It's not just a medical phenomenon. So we have got to invest in the people that have not been invested in. I, I mean, I, I generally study underappreciated assets, meaning if you just add water, it will grow. Well, the underinvested assets are in black communities. They're in the, the black entrepreneur. They're um, is in black housing. And, and it's to ensure that people um, have stable housing, could have an opportunity to buy a home, to, to start a business. And so when we get there, um, we will enlarge in the proverbial pot. I'll give you one this quick example of that. Black people represent about 14% of the population, but only 2% of the employer firms in the United States. If, if the employer firms match the black population, we would have 800,000 more black businesses in the economy, 800,000. Um, um, greater productivity, a greater employment, um, uh, just overall more wealth in the system. And so in this, in that regard, equity is stimulus. And so if we just invested toward that equity, you would see everyone benefit from that productivity. But, you know, we just don't, we, we just don't see it that way because our warped perspective of risk is so off. We see, we don't see the, yes. the true re return that can come from those investments. 